before we get started. I hope you saw the books are for sale in the lobby. Wainana will be with us uh, for a little while after the presentation out in the West Courtyard um, to sign those books and meet you and take pictures. It's beautiful out there. It's very Instagrammable with all the fall leaves. Um, I do want to make one quick announcement. Our theater department is putting on a production called The Thanksgiving Play by Larissa Fast Horse. Um, let me, I'll just read the description. Ah, Thanksgiving, the most American of holidays. When families gather to celebrate the warmth of home, the bounty of the harvest, and the legacy of genocide and violent colonial expansion. Good intentions collide with assertive assumptions in Larissa Fast Horse's wickedly funny satire as a troop of terminally woke teaching artists scrambles to create a pageant that somehow manages to celebrate both Turkey Day and Native American Heritage Month. I saw it this weekend, and it is absolutely hilarious, but thought-provoking and a little bit infuriating. And so I highly, highly recommend it. It plays again this weekend, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, it's very limited seating, so I would encourage you to get your tickets early. Uh, there's postcards out in front if you are interested. Um, and now to introduce our dis uh, distinguished guest, please welcome Alexander Gonzalez. to the mass. All of which inspire us to do the same and continue to fight the good fight. 
On behalf of the Speakers Forum, the Rain and Ice students, I welcome to the stage Winona LaDuke. Thank you all very much for the honor of being here with you today. It is indeed an honor to be here in your territory and for you allowing me to be here. It's a nice day, Nidogishka. That's how we say that in my neck of the woods, Nidogishka. So this moon in our, uh, in our language is, is uh, called Gashkad uh, Gizis, when it freezes over. The moon that follows that is, is called Manadu Gizis, Soons, Little Spirit Moon, Gishi Manadu Gizis, Great Spirit Moon. The Megan of Jesus is the Sutton Moon, or Nabon of Jesus, that's a hard crusted snow moon on March. You know, so it's freeze, it thaw, freeze again. Also called the moon you don't want to face plant in the snow. Then we have the uh, maple syrup moon, we have flower moon, wild of Jesus, or demon of Jesus. I just thought you'd like to hear a little bit of my language. You know, and the way we describe our, our land, and you have similar teachings here. You know, you have similar language here, but it, is, it describes a different place and a different time in the way that Mother Earth is, right? But I always like to, you know, share my language a little bit, and then, you know, did anybody notice that there's no monks named after Roman emperors in there? Did y'all get that? You know, it's possible to have an entire worldview that has nothing to do with empire. You know, it's okay. So that's a little bit of this moment in time when we have this chance to figure out who the heck we are in this world that we live in. You know, and in our Anishinaabe prophecies, this is called the time of the seventh fire, where it's said that our people will have a choice between two paths. One path, they say, will be well-worn, but it will be scorched. And the other path, they say, will not be well-worn, and it will be green. And it will be our choice upon which path to embark. And I'm pretty sure that's the path we all have at this moment in time as we face, whether it is climate change or the toxification of our water supplies. It's this moment we have this courageous moment to stand up and do the rest, the right thing. You know, be, be who we are. Be the people that the Creator put right here, right now, at this moment, to do that. So I'm going to talk about that. I was asked to talk about identity a little bit. And what I want to say is that this first slide here is... is um, from our territory, and she's a water protector. And I also am a water protector. And I think that in this day and time, it's a good thing to be a water protector. Because everybody in this room knows that you can live without a lot of things, but you cannot live without water. You cannot. And so this woman is, uh, she's a painting in, da in downtown Duluth. You know, she's painted by Botan out of Los Angeles, a gifted artist, this water protector woman. And a lot of us have experience of missing and murdered women in our families. We have that in our family, too. But this woman is not missing at all. She's about 20 feet wide and 30 feet tall. Downtown Beluga, 2nd Street and 2nd Avenue, right over ACO, American Indian Community Housing Organization, you know? And that's kind of like what part of what I love about this moment when we take back space. We redefine narrative. We make sure that we are visible. You know, we are known. And then our spirits are there. You know, so that's who this woman is. This is where I live, Kawawi I live on Lao Lake, in the middle of the White Earth Reservation. And I find language there. That's some art from our territory. I know a lot of you probably have seen this, but you know, this artist's name is Ray Thomas. He passed away. But this is a certain kind of Anishinaabe art. It started on birch bark and then pictographs, and then here it is in acrylic painting. But I like to show this art because when I was an undergraduate at Harvard University, if you wanted to study the art from Europe, you went to the fine arts department. And if you wanted to study indigenous art, you went to anthropology. And so what I want to talk a little bit about is the valuation of knowledge and whose knowledge is value. And you know, what it, what it is and what it means. And I'm going to humbly suggest that at this moment in time that we are in, perhaps the solution to the problems we face is not in the paradigm which created them. It is time to end that paradigm if we want to survive. 
You know, that is the reality of the courageous thinking that we have to have and be coherent people at this moment. So this art, this art, this piece of art is called We Are All in the Same Boat. You know, and I pretty much think that's true. No matter who we are, what color we are, or where we live, we are all in the same canoe because we all live here on our Mother Earth. And the challenges we face and the resistance and the growth of social movements at this point, you know, really marks this moment. This is my territory where we're harvesting wild rice, only place in the world that grows. You know, I know of course in Northern California, but we call that team rice. Diked patties is not the same thing as a lake, right? You know, two sticks in a canoe, that's the Thompsons on a, on a lake in the middle of the Tamarack Refuge, it's called the Tamarack Refuge, harvesting wild rice in August when nobody can use this wild rice making moon. That's what that's called. Now I talk a little bit about making America great again. This is my idea of when America was great. 8,000 varieties of corn, right? Y'all with me on that? That's when America was great. 8,000 varieties of corn, right? Tremendous agrobiodiversity. You know, that's what that is. And all of that corn, that didn't, you know, that came from here. That came from here, Western Hemisphere, along with the 900 varieties of potatoes. We're not slacking over here, we're busy. You know, making all kinds of cool stuff, growing all kinds of cool stuff, you know? And just, just to think about this, because on a worldwide scale, it is true, and it is true historically, who the seed keepers are, the people who, who define the genetics and grow the food are women. That's what women do. You know, and, and one of the reasons we do that is we're often the ones that cook, and we're the ones who put food away, and so you want to know how it tastes if you're going to keep growing that one, right? You understand what I'm saying, and so that's why women, you know, and so all those varieties was created by indigenous women. And I think that's really important to say because in, the, in California, the land of industrial ag, you know, Monsanto, Syngenta, none of them guys was around to do this cool stuff. Right? It's this stuff we did. You know, we did. And that's, you know, and everybody knows that survival is based on biodiversity. You know, at the same time when America was great, we had 50 million buffalo. You could drink the water out of every river and every lake. That's when America was great. When there was salmon in every street, and our people, and eels, and sturgeon. And our people remember that. We remember that. And America was great when those 50 million buffalo had 250 different species of grass that they ate, gra grazed upon in the great prairies, right? And I point that out for a number of reasons, but you know, in the same place where there was once 50 million buffalo, today there are about 28 million cattle. You know, the cattle that are not in California are in that northern plains territory, what they call the Midwest, and I think it's just like a made up term. Like, what, the mid of what west? You know what I'm saying? It's like, what crazy kind of term is that? But in any case, 28 million cattle in the same place you used to have 50 million buffalo. Now it turns out the 50 million buffalo didn't need a whole fossil fuels economy to take care of them. They just needed some grass and some wallows, right? Place to drink, place to eat. All winter, all winter they just go like this, go down and get their food, right? Think about that because that's what a post-petroleum economy looks like. A pre-petroleum and a post-petroleum economy. If you want to eat, you got to get the oil out of your food, right? And that's when America was great. And I also put these pictures up here because America is full of historic amnesia. Most people don't live where their parents lived. They know little of history. They know nothing about the indigenous people that are there. You know, that's a miracle. You know, a lot of people who are poorly, who lack knowledge. You know, and a lot of that has to do with transience. You know, a lot of that has to do with transience. And so, people have also an education system where things are not taught. And so people have historic amnesia, for sure. They don't know the history of the place. They don't know the history of their own people or where they came from, right? We do. We do. We do. But also, people have ecological amnesia, which is that they don't remember, you know, that there was water there that you could drink, or the fish that were there, or the trees that were there. We don't want to be those people. We want to remember everything, and we want to do our best to keep it. You know, where I live, <coughs> I call it where the wild things are. That's where I live. Wild rice, got deer, bears, wolves, coyotes, 
Wolverines. I got uh, porcupines. Right? I got uh, all kinds of fish. I got butterflies. I got frogs. I got insects. Where the wild things are, right? I just want to keep it that way. That's my covenant. That's our covenant. That's our agreement. The Creator. But uh, that's kind of a worldwide scale. The remaining biodiversity in the world is where indigenous people live. They say we're about 4% of the world's population with about 70% of the world's biodiversity that we protect. That's why it's really important to have this conversation and to make sure that our nations are strong, that our people are strong. Then there's this. Kind of the beginning of the problem, right? <laughs> At some level, definitely the beginning of the problem. Emblematic, for sure. But, you know, two different worldviews, for sure. You know, we could call it <laughs> the end of the capitalism era or whatever, but it's more than that. It's a worldview that is based on, on taking more than you need and not leaving the rest. It's not just a capitalist framework. I refer to it as Windigo economics, the economics of the capital. And so, you know, this is what it looks like. It looks like this in terms of agriculture, you know, fossil fuels all over this, and it looks like that in terms of tar sands and oil. Now I know that California is like every other state, you know, we're all a bunch of fossil fuel acts, right? Now honestly, we didn't ask to get put in that situation, but we better acknowledge what's going on. You know, when you live in a fossil fuels economy, you're kind of like all jacked up on something. Kind of like being on coke. <laughs> Y'all understand exactly what I'm saying, you know? Okay, so I'm just saying that that's where we are. And the problem with living in this society, which consumes so much of the world's energy resources, particularly fossil fuels, you know, Canada is one of the only countries that exceeds us in per capita energy consumption, per capita water consumption. Told me, someone told me that we use about 75 gallons of water a day in America. Might be less here in California, but you know, Inuit people living in the far northern villages, they're at about a gallon, two gallons a day. You understand what I'm saying? It's like amazing. Thinking about that, right? Anyway, extractive ownership, extractive practices, laying to waste, not leaving the rest. And the thing is, is that when you get into that kind of a system, which we are in, because of a set of inefficient choices that were made for a bunch of profits, you know, backroom deals, a bunch of bad ideas. Frankly, let's just get rid of a lot of really bad ideas were made. Really bad decisions were made, right? And in that process, you end up when you do a lot of crazy stuff to get your fix of fossil fuels. So it's called extreme extraction, the time that we are in in the world, extreme extraction. And what that means is it's like, you used to have like oil gushing out of wells in places, right? Well, that's like not so easy to come by anymore. So you do things like, you know, for coal, you do things like blow off the top of 500 mountaintops in Appalachia, you know, and ship that stuff over to India because you ain't even burning it in this country, right? But just rearrange the geography. Or maybe you go and you, you know, drill 20,000 feet into the ocean because you figure you can do it. And that works out until, you know, you get something like uh, deep water horizon, right? And then you know that didn't actually work out. You're a really fabulously smart, I'm so clever idea, right? And then you do stuff like maybe you, like, because your fix is so bad, you gotta do stuff like the tar sales, which is taking something which is basically asphalt, figuring out how to shove it in some pipes in the most expensive, the dirtiest energy in the world, the dirtiest oil in the world is the tar sands. 82 bucks a barrel for basically sludge and no pipes, you know? That's when you're like in extreme extraction or fracking, right? Blow up the bedrock of Mother Earth, shed 502 chemicals down there that you don't have to report because of the Energy Policy Act of 2005 authored by Dick Cheney. And, and, and somebody makes the assumption, including in California, that what goes down is not going to come up, right? Like, what kind of dumb stuff is that? Get real. You know, everybody in this room knows that all of that is a set of dodgy, dodgy, hope that's going to work out for us ideas, right? For as long as I'm not going to speak, you know? So that's what's extreme extraction. And I point that out because it's kind of like being a junkie, if you see what I'm saying. At a certain point, you do more and more crazy stuff. 
to fulfill that fix, right? Now, I got addicts in my family. I don't know if any of you have addicts in your family. They're kind of a drag. You know, I always want to be honest about it. They like, lie, they rationalize stuff. It's always your fault. You know, there's always all of the that. You know? And I'm like, you know, so my point is, is that, you know, I'm, I'm a fossil fuel addict. And I just want to own that. And I think that we need to go through like a collective fossil fuels addiction counseling. Are y'all with me on this? See what I'm saying? I had an excellent 50 years in the fossil fuel economy. It's all I've ever known. I'm just ready to move on out. I want a graceful transition. You follow me on this? I want a graceful transition. Because I think that'd be a really good idea. Thank you so much. Awesome. Let's move on out. Right? And that's what we've got to do. You know, so this is kind of that moment in the time of the seventh fire when you got to do that thing. Right? So this is, you know, this is the, what it looks like. And this is what it looks like. Oh, this wasn't your fires. This was Fort McMurray up in Alberta. Caught on fire. Part of the tar sands. <clears throat> caught on fire. But, you know, could have been you guys all last year, right? Into this year. Right? Never, no, you know, so what we have, we, we have now entered the era of catastrophes of biblical proportions. You know, that's what's going on. Just, just stick your head up a little bit, take a look, you know, take a look around and say, that's what's going on. You got storms to the south that are like unprecedented in size, right? The entire west coast was on fire last year. The Arctic is melting, right? It is melting up there. And in the east, you've got like a crazy man with orange hair <laughs> screaming, I'm gonna burn down the house, you know? Right? Catastrophes of biblical proportions. I mean, that's a political catastrophe of biblical proportions, you know? So this is what it costs, you know? Because most people are like, oh, it ain't much. Well, look at that, you know? I don't know how much it's going to cost. Everybody knows that people in California ain't going to be able to get no fire insurance, pretty sure, soon, right? Right? Let alone anything else. So my point is, is, that, is that, you know, I don't know which state or which tribe or which country has a budget for climate change related disasters. None of us do. You know, and, and people of color, you know, if you just take a look at who is the last served in a catastrophe, That'd be us. You know, that'd be us. So we definitely should be thinking about this stuff, right? You know, this is, this is our chance to be those people that our ancestors said was going to be here. The people who was like, we got this, we got this. But you know, in the bigger picture, and this is you guys, California, you know? This was like some study by somebody else. I was like, well, it looks like California. You know? So I point this stuff out, and you guys hung out with me. I go to this place, it's really conservative, northern kind of redneck, deep north people. And I was like, this is expensive stuff. Y'all understand the kind of people I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there, you know, so, and I just come like, no, this isn't like red, red Rick. This is the price tag. You know, it's going to be cold, the power's going to go out, you got a plan. Yeah, that's really the question, right? You know, that's kind of the question. It ain't like Republicans and Democrats. Or it ain't, you know, it's the reality. All right, so when civil society is to come to a bunch of addictions, you get this. These are standing rock photos, right? A lot of you, you know, probably went up. Did any of y'all here go to standing rock? Yeah, thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. The rest of you, thank you for your support. Yeah. Like, this is what addiction does when, when you put a bunch of money and police with it. You know, this is my point. And this is like the moment where you realize that in this country, what's quite obvious is that the rights of corporations supersede the rights of individuals. Right? And that is a little bit problematic. And I know that the Supreme Court has affirmed in the Citizens United that corporations aren't by persons under the law. But everybody in this room knows that a corporation is not a person. A person has a soul. A corporation does not have a soul. Right? I always think that anyway, if a corporation was a person, they'd be like a person with a multiple personality disorder. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You have three or four mergers, acquisitions, a couple of trades. Like, who the hell are you? Right? 
before you go bankrupt, right? But you know, so I come to Standing Rock because we fought a pipeline. I've been fighting the Anchorage Corporation, the single largest pipeline company in North America, and the third largest corporation in Canada for seven years. Seven years. I've been fighting. They still got no pipe. They still got no pipe. Piper, which is a fractal pipeline to come from the Bakken oil fields in North Dakota across the northern part of my reservation. We didn't know anything about pipelines. You know, we're just a bunch of, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm smart, I, I got energy experience, but, you know, pipelines never really bothered me, and that's part of the problem that we're figuring out is that nobody paid attention to pipelines all these years. Because underground, it turns out that they're all, like, disintegrating, right? And blowing up. I mean, we are a country with a D in infrastructure. Like, I thought we were all first world and everything, right? I mean, we aren't first world. We're like D in infrastructure, energy infrastructure. So anyway, they want to put a new practical pipeline across my reservation. We go out and we start organizing or educating ourselves about it, realize the risk of it. You know the risk of it. We got all this water. Half of our reservation is water. 47 lakes, 500 bodies of water. But not good for pipeline. No. You know, not that any place is, but that's really bad idea. You know, all that wild rice. We got out, we built a, you know, we talked to non-Indian people. You know, my theory is, was, was get the Norwegians, man. You know, there's all these Norwegians in northern Minnesota and all these, you know, Finns. And I was like, those guys should get mad about this too. Who's in there is out there and filing lawsuits and everything. So anyway, three years we fight in 2016, August 2nd. August 2nd, the Enbridge Corporation cancels the pipeline project. Cancels it. I wonder if they want to run And so I say that to you because it is possible to beat a pipeline project. And in fact, Enbridge lost another one in Canada too, so they got two that they didn't not get. You know, which means that they're really, really mad. <laughs> you know how companies get. But anyway, so when they didn't, they didn't get the pipeline across our territory, they went out and financed this pipeline. This is the Dakota Access Pipeline, and the initial proposal was to run the pipeline just north of the city of Bismarck, North Dakota, which is 95% white. And of course, it's the state capital where the decisions are made that promote oil development. You know, but instead of running the pipeline just north of the city of Bismarck, they decided that that was too risky for the city of Bismarck, so they should just run it north of the Standing Rock Reservation, just north of their water intake in the Missouri River. Right? And so that's, that's like the beginning of what the injustice looks like, right? But that's like a long history in North Dakota, which we refer to as the Deep North. You know, for a set of good reasons, which became obvious during Standing Rock. So this is what we saw when we went out there. Enbridge bought 28% of this pipeline. Financially shored up that corporation, known as Energy Transfer Partners. And in doing that, also financed this. A lot of people, this is just you know, a few of the photos. But you know, there was a time out there where there's been noise equipment. You know, you probably see it in California, but I never saw anything like that. There's this one piece of equipment called an AMRAP. AMRAP, Mind Resistant Armor Personnel Carrier. This other piece called an LRAD, Long Range Acoustic Device. The AMRAP drives through a building. You know, just drives through it. The LRAD busts your eardrums off. Now the question should be asked in this country why my military equipment is deployed on civilians. You know, and as it's across this country, obviously, there's been a lot of deployment and the, you know, the surplus of military equipment to civilian police forces. That's wrong. That's wrong. You know, but this is us getting sprayed. And then this is my favorite, one of my favorite photos from Standing Rock. When you're facing the line of riot police, you should stand on your horse. Isn't that great? I just love those guys, man. I have the privilege of spending a lot of time with these guys. They help us on our horse programs on my reservation in my community, and I ride with these guys a lot. They taught me a lot about life. They're good, they're good, good men, courageous. But, you know, this is the pictures of, of, of Standing Rock and, and the you know, brutality of what happens to civil society when oil companies run your country. You know, because that's where we're off, we're at, you know? It's kind of like the junkies hanging out with the dealer, and the dealer's making public policy. You know, and that's really not what you want in a democracy. Yeah, you know, it's really not a good plan. 
You know, and everybody in this room probably wants the system to work. I do. You know, I'd like cycling to work. Right? You know, I just really want to farm and, you know, raise horses and take care of cool stuff, grow hell. You know? <laughs> so this is what happens to civil society, too. You know, this is, this is out in North Dakota. That should say, take it out by a, you know, no Indian people didn't take that at all. Those white people. Same thing up there, you know, and this is our, our missing number of women. You know, North Dakota, Northern Minnesota have a whole, you know, like a lot of other places, we have a lot of that, you know. So this is the pipeline balance, you know, and I said, uh, I just to say, and then I finish up the bad part of this, but there's, you know, there's, uh, two years ago there was five pipelines proposed out of Canada. What you have as a country, you know, everybody acts all like Canada's a nice country. They aren't a nice country at all. You need to, like, review your assessment because almost every environmental problem I have in Minnesota comes from Canada. That's to say, they have the dirtiest oil in the world. 250 gigatons of CO2 is in that gigatons. And that's the stuff that should stay in the ground. Like if anything should stay in the ground, the dirtiest damn oil in the world should stay in the ground, right? But they got one plan for their economy, which is extract that oil. That's the plan. You know, they don't have like a plan B. And so people gotta have a plan B, because that stuff makes a plan, right? So they have these five projects, that's the only plan. This, this one with the spots on it, that was Energy East. No province wanted a pipeline that died. That purple one, that was a pipeline known as um, the Northern Gateway. That was an Enbridge pipeline, that didn't work. There's three pipelines left, this Keystone, there's this confusing thing in the middle, which is a battle that continues to rage. Obama did not issue the cross-border permits. Trump came in and issued them when he came in with his like magic fairy dust wand of public policy where he makes up what he can do. And uh, that's an illegal mess too, you know? And then this blue one here, that I refer to that as Trudeau West. And that's a pipeline that they couldn't get a pipeline built to the West Coast because nobody wanted that pipeline and because people stood up. So Kinder Morgan, the United States Corporation, backed up and the Canadian government purchased that pipeline project for $4.5 billion. And then the day after they purchased it, the, the Supreme Court of British Columbia uh, ruled that all permits were null and void because they had not consulted with the First Nations. So then Canada had a pipeline. Canada had a pipeline without any permits. So now he's trying to come up with some configuration. He can't make this shit up. Excuse my French. He's got this project called the Reconciliation Pipeline Project, and he's got some First Nations that are members. These little tribes, like 50 people, they're going to own that pipeline and all that debt. He's making up stuff. But anyway, then that last one's ours. Okay, that's what we're fighting. That's what it looks like on the ground. I'll show you this map. Remember this map. Go to our website, honorearth.com.